Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just before uh, I welcome and open the meeting, uh, there's a little bit of good and sad news, really, basically. You know, we all value very much our committee clerks we have. Uh, Cameron will be leaving us after 22 years to take care of his time. So, uh, I think uh, I speak on behalf of everyone in the building. Uh, we will miss Carolyn to go and see us. Like all our clerks, you know, they are a wealth of experience. They give us all the backing we need. So, Carolyn, well, thank you, and have a wonderful, happy retirement. But you're a girl, yeah, anyway, I think. Of the process. 
Now these were designed from you know, a, a lot of variety of different comments and summarised into these A to F um, ideas and concepts. Overall, the, there is no silver bullet to this. There's no one solution that will get rid of emissions and everything clean and you know health issues, etc. Um, but the, the main source of the problem is the continuing and ongoing and expanding use of fossil fuels. That's what one of the main problems comes from. Now, when it comes to that, there's a lot of different solutions you can undertake in terms of addressing that. But I'll just go through some of the A2F on the 313. Um, <coughs> one of the main ones in A is about the, the desire and the, the drive for strong regional lead. If, if there's not really the desire and the will and the drive and the, and the, the demand to do this, you, you're going to struggle if there isn't a real um, kind of strong leadership from that side of things. B is about, before you can do anything about a situation that you know you're in, you need to know what, what the data is, what the background is, exactly where you are, where, where you're coming from. And we do have quite a lot of that data, it's perhaps not used in the best way, perhaps not the best uh, quality of data that we need to really tackle this as a little city region pro uh, approach. We need to state strategic goals, was another one of the key issues that came out, and through that you need to be aligned with your resources, policies, everything needs to kind of come into line to make sure that you're all heading in the right direction. So from those top three straight away, you're not even looking at things like what's going to cost a lot of money, we need new technologies, we need, you know, we need the leadership, the desire, the lined up of approaches. That will probably get you quite a long way down the road before you can start to move into the more difficult, more expensive, more technical uh, options there. A lot of the solutions, indeed, they're actually quite well known. You just need to piece some of these different approaches together and commit to it. The kind of the strength is in the sum of its parts rather than the whole thing in the end. Then we get into the finances, they're obviously an issue. Some of the technologies are quite expensive. Obviously, currently, over the last few years, there's been a lot of budget and financial restraint. So, that's the financial aspect has already always been an issue. Um, things like investor save or something look at in terms of looking what the payback might be in the future. And also, the final one is about looking at what you've already got. As I said, there's various solutions already that you need to piece together, and some of those aren't usually need to develop, they're already there, so it's just about thinking about strategically, about drive, understanding what your data is, what the situation is, what you've got to have, and then, and then utilizing that the best way possible. So from the interviews of looking at what the situation is and what the drivers are for us to try and reduce emissions, we've come up with the recommendations on the title there, 340, just a book, proposal to move forward. And it's this uh, recommendations from 316 that we're presenting to the meeting today for you to kind of hopefully approve. We hope just go through those uh, recommendations. Uh, I was requested to make sure that we were kept in contact with the local authorities, the quality officers, the environmental officers, um, and that was done. And we have got so far not a full response from all those that were contacted that we've had contact in the past with. But overall, the response is looking like they're very supportive of the general broad concept of these recommendations, which I think, in terms of the purpose of the report, is very useful because, as you'll see later on in the recommendations, that these need to go off to groups such as transport access group time to look at what the recommendation says and work out the best process for delivery of the recommendation. So there is a little stage to go, but generally getting quite broad some consensus that yeah this is the kind of direction we need to look at how we then deliver those recommendations. So again the 316, you've got a suggestion about procurement. Uh, so now some of these aspects will refer to the local city region. Some maybe actions that specific authorities such as Mersey Travel may want to take forward in their own operations or literature otherwise. So whilst air quality carbon emissions is definitely a regional issue that must need to be looked at on the transport part of the road. There are some aspects that each authority can do on their own that are relevant to them particularly, not necessarily to others, but there's no reason why you can't share best practice across. Um, procurement is quite a powerful tool anyway in terms of many things on your demanding or requesting that uh, suppliers meet certain criteria, you, you can you know, help you to control your impact, whether it be related to emissions or finance or, or any other aspect like that. In particular, for emergency travel and uh, say public transport and buses, you could look at support contracts to see how far we can go in terms of requesting the buses across certain emission levels, etc. Obviously, all these balance with costs, 
budgets and accountability. And so again, just to say about these recommendations, so those recommendations are something to look at how we actually deliver those. We need to investigate a bit further. Some may come out that how can we do that? We can do this other approach. I think that is uh, would, would be a good start anyway going forward for the transport plan for growth for 16, 17 years. Um, second bit again about data and about performance. Um, you need to know what your standards are, what the current situation is, so you can see what improvements you're making. Maybe small things and maybe improvements. You always need data, you need evidence, you need to be managing performance so you can see where you're going, where you need to change, where things are working, and where you need to kind of look at your results. C is one of those specific mercy travel targets because we do have a carbon management plan currently and we did set a carbon management plan target of 24% initially about three or four years ago. It was revised down to somewhere more like seven, seven and a half percent. Um, but since we did that, projects have come online that we believe have taken us beyond that, which will be reported later on when the end of the financial year comes and new data gets in. So now that we've surpassed our original carbon target with the carbon management plan, one of the recommendations there as well, since we've got process in place and we're doing quite well and know how to approach this, we need to review that when it comes to the end and set another one. Again, that's specific for most travel because we have that process in place, but other authorities could look at that and know other authorities have got carbon targets, etc. Um, but again, that's one to be sure, but most travel specifically needs to look out and continue its carbon management plan. Um, as I said, generally about the recommendations, transport advisory groups are recommended to or requested to look at the approach, um, referencing all the recommendations, um, I think. Transport plan for growth has got a real target around emissions and air quality. One of the, the, the city region uh, growth objectives. Um, and the transport advisory group is the local authorities, the districts coming together with representation on that group looking at how they do the transport plan for growth. So they would be a good group to kind of have a, a sense check and a practical check on how we go forward in delivering on not, as the case may be, or even adding to some of these recommendations. Um, again, part of that is. Uh, quality carbon is, as I said earlier, a, a city region wide. It, you know, trans just like transport pollution doesn't see boundaries that we see, it doesn't stop, it just carries on going and it goes where it wants to go. So you need to have quite a broad approach to how you look at these aspects. Um, and there is a view that you know we need to look at exactly where transport is moving around in the district for many reasons, whether it's looking at freight, whether it is an air quality issue, whether it's access, getting goods and people and services flowing around the region. We need to look at quality carbon in that same context as that as well, rather than smaller pockets. Um, the other bit as well, as we've said, that there's, there's aspects that we're already continually doing that perhaps don't cost us much money, it's not as difficult. Uh, was looking at the most travel engagement team and the smarter choices uh, of those who've been involved in LTP previously, kind of travel-wise, walking side of aspects. You can get some great results from that. And it's about looking at how we can continue to develop that or our low emission low carbon solutions. On I, we're looking at profile, awareness raising, understanding is, is always key to making sure that something stays at the forefront of our minds and the forefront of our agenda. Um, and so it's making sure that that's engaged with all the different partners and stakeholders and see what role they can play. So it's, a, it, it's teamwork, this is not one person or one organisation to be able to solve it, needs to work together, uh, do their part. Uh, and the final one, which is something um, happily we've already kind of progressed pretty well, is the impact of the rolling stock projects uh, very from the start, the inception, and the production of the tender documents. We did have sustainability assessments undertaken on that to make sure that the trains are as sustainable, as low carbon, and environment friendly, whatever the phrase is that we want to use uh, as possible within the possible cost of the budget constraints. Overall, it comes to Mersey Rail because the trains are obviously electric and not diesel and releasing smoke, etc. not really an issue for their quality. But obviously, carbon emissions come from the generation of electricity somewhere else. Yeah, this is one of those where we don't actually have control of that, we're going to partnership work and looking at the energy contracts, etc. But the road stock project, we have been heavily involved in that, the best way of sourcing materials, where we buy them from, how the trains they operate um, on a day to day basis to try and get that energy reduction and, and save carbon. Um, looking at the resource implications, well, as usual from the reports, there, there isn't any review or a 
any organization or authority that wants to take forward any of these, there will be resource implications, whether that be the financial, human, or physical assets. Uh, and I, but I think they will be come out to be uh, looked at when a project or program is developed. As we said earlier, it's sort of, the, sort of just a case of using existing mechanisms together and spending a bit of time on that. You don't necessarily have to go with big, huge uh, financial projects. Um, risks and mitigation. As we've said, there's, there is an EU threat to the UK as a whole could be fined for not reaching um, uh, uh, quality legislative targets, which could run into billions. But I know there's something on that scale that governments are working with the EU on exactly what that might mean when that comes to pass. The main threat was that through the localism bill, it could have decided that when government gets paid, it gets fined £30 billion, pounds, they just then split that out between the districts that are not the worst in quality. That's one of the kind of worst threats. Nothing has come out to say exactly what they would do about it or whether they're going to be happening or not. So. But if they did, it, it would be an issue. The knock on from that is obviously the health of the region, what the Liverpool City region wants to be seen as clean, green, somewhere to invest, somewhere to come and live and work. So if we want to present a region that's not benefit from that, we need to be looking at doing certain uh, projects and programmes and following that theme. Um, just to conclude then, it's kind of the basics of the, the issue we've got. The problem is, you know, fossil fuels, continual burn of fossil fuels, no matter where you're burning them, no matter what you're doing, are releasing um, emissions that are harmful to health, harmful to the environment, etc. So we need to move away from a fossil fuel based transport system as well as a low carbon uh, economy and a low carbon world, essentially. Um, some of the solutions. You know, about more efficient vehicles, moving towards lower range of transport, walking, cycling, etc. That's fine, as I said, they already exist. And the final bit is probably the, the, the bit about the way forward that we need to do is about that high level strategic political commitment, about the fact that this committee requested this work get done for a start, shows that it's in line with the transport plan for growth, it's something that you're keen on, you've recognised as an issue, so we've come out with some recommendations that people can take forward. Um, in the coming years, how does their field fit? So I think that's there. And then just put the resource investment with its finance, people, etc., into place to ensure that people you know, can deliver on these and working together um, to kind of minimise some of those financial resource um, implications by sharing activities, sharing the project, and all thinking of the hate and taking pieces it is and not undertaking tasks that sometimes contradict each other and make some work on this side, not work on the other. But having that good kind of data and overview and that understanding of exactly what the situation is is one of the main things at the beginning points. So then you go where you go and obviously you can't do that. Um, any questions? Happy to try and answer them if I can. Thank you. Thanks for that, Stephen. Stephen seconds of that. A good walk through uh, the new pause. John? Thanks, Chair. Uh, issues I want to approach at the moment. First of all, thank you, Chair, for allowing me to chair this particular subcommittee because it's an issue that's dear to my heart and I know it's close to a lot of people's hearts on this particular uh, uh, committee. So I thank you very much for that. I uh, just want to set this debate in some sort of context, really, in terms of the way we look at climate change. Um, I've been reading a lot about this uh, recently. And currently, we send up something like 36 billion tonnes climate change gases into the planet's atmosphere. Um, that is the recommended maximum level. The current rate is 55 billion tonnes. And that will move the planet's temperature from its current average, I mean, find the strength to believe its current average is only 15 degrees across the planet. Since 1880, since the records were first put in place, it's gone up by 0.85 degrees centigrade. Now, if it reaches the magical two, 2 degrees centigrade, by 2050, we could lose up to 50% of the planet, plants and animals. So that's how serious this agenda is. Now, let's bring that back down, all the way back down to what we can do here in terms of, uh, of our agenda here on, in, on Merseyside. Um, just look at the recommendations are going through 3.16. So obviously, I'm very fortunate to chair to I know I've answered a lot of these questions, but I think they should be out there and put the agenda. So we need to monitor all of these from A to G, so I'm just A to, sorry, A to J. And I'm just wondering how closely and how regularly we're going to do we're going to do that. Second question is the issue about um, if you look under resource implications, 
the amendment under 4.2 uh, would require resource allocation from the relevant delivery partners. And I'm wondering how do we go about ensuring that buy in from our delivery partners, of which this organisation has many, something like 13 or 14 hundred deliveries, I think. Now, the final question, really, uh, I wanted to outline was the issue about where do we go from here. I'm keen to drive this agenda forward. Colleagues around this table are keen to drive this agenda forward. So I'm looking to convene future meetings about how we actually drill down and drive this agenda forward. So a number of questions, a number of comments. So thanks for your indulgence, Chair and colleagues. Thanks for that, Phil. I think uh, what you said, how do we drive this forward? I think this is, as far as Mayor's Travel is concerned, this is the first step. Uh, the link, obviously, for that, as Stephen said, the districts and also, hopefully, Liverpool City Region, which they've also had the missions uh, scoop me up. This will hopefully support their emissions strategy. Uh, so that's the way forward there. But I think this is the initial step as far as we're concerned with transport. But Stephen, have you got anything else to add on that? Yeah, thanks, Joe. Um, thanks for especially the comments at the end about you being people that want to drive this forward because quite often back with why we're up through this, you said to do this, so to have that kind of endorsement, excellent. I think the first question is one that I can hopefully answer. The Transport Plan for Growth, as I said earlier, has got real key carbon emissions reduction focus within it. Um, so my view, and partly because some of the recommendations will go through the tag, is that we've pretty much written a very high level plan for the Transport Plan for Growth, for the partners in delivering it. And if they go through the recommendations and work out ways that they might deliver some of those and add to and build on it, I think we've set the strategic plan for one element of the transport plan for growth already. In terms of monitoring that, I think in the future my team, in terms of the performance team that I lead, may be responsible for doing that performance monitoring of the transport plan for growth so we can ensure that every quarter when we get the updates and reports, and when we look at the data, how they're collecting the emissions data for the region, have a quite a good solid, you know, regular updates of what we're getting to on that. But I think overall, what I, what I found, just summarising the report, it, it's just that aspect that your recommendations here that come out through the interviews has to start a plan for delivering one of the elements of the transport plan for growth. I'm sure that all the other elements will also need a plan for growth. We almost be a little bit of a step ahead by going to the emissions bit there. There's a plan to work through the type of districts. There's quite a number of things we can get done there without too much change. Thanks, Steve. Uh, Liz, do you have anything? Thanks, Chair. Yeah, obviously, just to, to remind members, this is a review piece of work of this um, subcommittee is commissioned. So it now goes back into to Mayor's and Travel, and as Stephen said, this particular piece of work will also be referred to time. We will then bring back a report to the full Mayor's and Travel Committee with recommendations of officers, and also that will include how we want to take forward linked to the wider transport plan for growth. Yeah, I understand where we are in, in the protests. I haven't read through the report. It seems though there's a lean in towards the cost of safety vehicles, lean and engines, different type of technology. I don't think we should lose track of us as an influencer of people and their behaviours because at the end of the day, that's what's going to change, change it. If every individual changes their behaviour, only a small fraction that I think you mentioned it, uh, small changes for big improvements. If every citizen of, of the city region did things slightly differently, that's where you have a massive, massive effect. So I think, you know, with, with, uh, that will come as a matter of the high level commitments. Yes, we want to do this, but at the end of the day, it's, a, it's about human beings, about human behavior. We have already have a group of people who we can influence directly, which are our staff. Then everyone else who purchases with us or makes for us or is contracted to us, we have a, a sphere of influence there. But at the end of the day, we're going to get, have to get out to the millions of people on Merseyside and have changed in behaviour. Maybe you know, leave your car home for one day or some, you know, the, those type of changes that will make a massive impact. So uh, it's, it sounds a bit like a, a techno approach to it, but at the end of the day, it's about human beings and uh, I didn't want to lose that in the discussion. That's it. Thanks, Chair. Yeah, uh, I, I totally agree with what Councillor Fox is saying. In 3.16 uh, pages, um, 
paragraph G, and we obviously start to talk about engagement, the best um, engagement team. Well, that really is a wider piece about the game change, which is about encouraging people to travel differently, as well as the walking cycling, about using public transport and the like. And then there's that wider piece of work around procurement and supply chain and how we take that out into the forward to uh, what we'll make sure that's happening in terms of response. Well, the likes of that as well, Steve, is, you know, this is. As said, is one of the first steps to that change and to uh, getting people's perceptions and awareness uh, focused on the change we want to direct. Tony? Yeah, I think the, uh, it's a good report, but I think you've been a bit modest in how far I'm going to travel out going with low emission vehicles and so on and so forth. I'm aware that I'm going to travel working with energy saving trust to secure funding, government funding, DLT funding, to put more power, power points throughout the city region and strategic points. Now, you've already started, but you can put that in the report and say, this is where we're going now. It's banging it from, it's, it's worth banging because you've actually been doing the job. It's, you know, it's good. Thanks for that, Tony. But as you say, you know, we have started one of the one of the following one is in the PowerPoints, but also got our electric vehicles as well, for example. But I mean, this was a review basically looking at emissions. Um, I mean, the things you are talking about, they might have emissions of a, a, a power generating plant, but the point is they're not local. But as I say, it's, it's the step forward to start the process going, and this is hopefully it will gel in with all uh, any other reviews or scrutiny that's going on. So, any further questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. thanks. Thanks again. Thanks for your indulgence. I'm not formally a member of this committee, but I couldn't sit on my hands and say nothing because equally I'm as passionate about this as all members are. Because let's be very, very blunt about it. This is talking about the quality of the earth that we've got, the area that we live in, that we pass on to our children and grandchildren. And we can't sort of not uh, deal with this issue, otherwise, the alternatives have done bad thinking about it. Um, I think what's been pulled together here is a really good step in the right direction and lots of very good sort of angles to, to focus on over the, the years ahead. But for me, there's also an elephant in the room that hasn't been wrestled with, I'm afraid, because it touches on the points that Steve was making. It's really about human behaviour and how we get sort of individuals to change to make sure we have something that's much more sustainable does less damage to our environment. For me, that's actually about making sure that public transport is the number one choice of getting around from A to B. It actually involves making sure that all of our operators have a proper growth strategy to make sure that public transport is the number one choice. Now, I know we've got that with the rail operators. We've got that in place with Mersey Rail. We're getting that in place with Northern Rail via Rail North. The bit that frustrates me is I don't see that coming through from the bus companies. Genuinely, I don't. I think if you look at patronage, it just continues to bump along the bottom. The kind of approach that's being taken at this moment in time from the, the different bus companies isn't one about use the bus as the first choice. And bearing in mind that 80% of public transport journeys in this conurbation are on the bus, and we know we can significantly increase that. It really is a five to midnight moment for them to think about how are they going to get more people on the bus. And that involves a hell of a lot of different things, whether it's actually the fare structure, the marketing proposition, the cleanliness, um, the way that it integrates with the railway, a whole host of different kind of uh, aspects, but all actually vital to make sure there's something uh, which gives people a better option than what is there at this moment in time. So I think, for me, that's one of the things that this naturally needs to lead on to, because if we're really serious about this, some fantastic recommendations here about cleaning up our own app, genuinely how do we clean up the city regions act by making sure that we've got a, a network of public transport services which is the number one choice not the last resort if you don't have a car and you know within all of that it really has to be a clarion call to the bus companies to say step up and deal with this because if you don't we will need to take a different approach i can't get really blunt to them that so thanks for indulging me but i would hope that would be the next stage of where it's going to lead to Thanks for that, Leo. And of course, uh, when we were, used to be an integrated transport authority, integration uh, 
would mean that we'd have control of the entire transport network. Now, I've always banged the drum that until we get some sort of overall control of the transport network, there'll never be an integrated authority. And to do that, we need to be able to have the buses do what we want them to do and burn the fuels that we want them to burn. Uh, but, I mean, you can see by the, 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 the strength of feeling which is been voiced by a number of uh, colleagues that uh, we're all in favour of this. So, there's no more questions. Can I ask you to uh, agree the recommendations on paragraph two of the report? Uh, before I close this bit, says, uh, can I thank John and the uh, transport clerks and all the people who attended this review from Mersey Rail and all the operators because without their input we couldn't have uh, put this review together. So can we thank everybody for that please? So, okay, thank you. So now can we go for item five, uh, the customer and passenger satisfaction review. Katrina. Thanks, Chair. Um, okay, a workshop with members Customer satisfaction is identified as a priority and further work is required. So we held a series of interviews uh, in January and this report summarises some of the key findings. With the recommendations, there's three in total. Um, the first recommendation is to request further work and is undertaken around a fuller picture of the customer experience and feedback can be utilised to support planned improvement activities. Second is to review the work undertaken by Passenger Focus and the Mr. Shopper Program's work to develop an internal customer experience research program. And the third is to ensure officers are able to better use appropriate customer data to inform service, infrastructure, product development, and deliver to effective evidence-based decision making. So I'd like to give you a bit of background and context in this report. Um, Back to what is customer satisfaction? Well, it refers to the extent to which customers are happy with products or services provided by a business. So, linking customer satisfaction with expectations will enable an organisation to identify areas for improvement, potentially result in a gain within the market, and ultimately increasing the customer's loyalty, cost, and brand. It's worth noting that all businesses and organisations must strike a careful balance between satisfying customers and affordability um, of, the services, um, of the service provision. So what we did at Mersey Travel we, um, for this review, we had some structured interviews from by elected members with the support of myself. Um, these were held in January. And we interviewed a selection of uh, bus operators, rail operator, passenger focus, and also Vince came along as a director of public development within Mersey Travel. So the first area that came out of this was customer satisfaction and the influences on service offered. Um, customer satisfaction ratings were key to influencing services offered. Customer needs are changing and moving on. They want more than just a journey from A to B. They want technology, advanced information, information on the go, and a clear path regarding comments. Um, once customers have recognised what improvements have been made as a result of their feedback, customers would use services again and spread word, um, hopefully improving patronage. Key drivers of public transport include quality of service, accessible information, functionality and frequency. So the second area that came out from this review was um, using customer intelligence within the organisation by customer comments. So uh, customer comments handling were a very important source of customer intelligence and how these were handled ultimately influenced the overall customer satisfaction rating of an organisation. One operator felt it was important to be back on these trends and it was usually reported at managers' meetings and depots. Um, there's a commitment to passengers to respond to comments within seven days, but the new technology, the response, um, even only a hold and response was issued on the same day, so that's by one operator. Um, another thing that came out was about Facebook and Twitter accounts. Comments can be re um, reported and reacted to quickly. And in terms of Twitter, it means that things can often be dealt with on the spot. So this is another effective medium for operators to deal with their customers. Um, Mercy Travel response time to customer comments has improved significantly in recent months. We have a target here of 21 
so considered to evolve in terms of customer satisfaction, but Marcy Travel's common system did not provide a full picture for Marcy Travel itself. Um, comments were often forwarded on to boss or real um, operators, um, and the director of corporate development noted that a different way of working is needed. This should be jointly with operators to um, measure customer satisfaction and provide a full picture. Um, as customer expectations change, it's important for Marcy Travel to be able to respond as soon as possible in a more effective manner and also in a more real time way. The next area that jumped out was around um, market research and its value and what we currently do. So passenger focus um, on the quantity on quantitative surveys was one area that we discussed. Passenger focus surveys were regarded as important national benchmarking activities. Passenger focus surveys are um, ask users of public transport to rate their overall experience and the individual elements that make up this rating. It drives quality by understanding national travel in relation to passengers and putting them at the centre of the conversation with partners. Um, bus operators, sorry, one bus operator noted that they use the detailed passenger focus results to help them shape and complement their own customer satisfaction surveys, and they also use the results to influence the service they offered. And this was again replicated by the other bus operator we spoke to. The next area um, from our market research was Mystery Shoppers. Um, Mercy Travel's Mystery Shopping program is designed to understand how a typical customer would perceive their overall experience when traveling by bus or rail in Merseyside or when at, um, accessing Mercy Travel's assets, um, such as the travel centers. Um, Mystery Shopping provides real insight into how shoppers objectively rate the experience. Mercy Travel's Mystery Shopping program gathers information on experience along with precise um, journey information. So it's a very useful piece of work to delve into the detail um, of why um, a customer rates their journey in the way they do. Another element to come out from this review was understanding the customer journey from start to finish. And there's different things that we need to consider when we look at the journey from start to finish. The first one that came out was information. Real-time information um, and disruption updates are seen as key drivers to improving satisfaction scores. Similarly, ticketing came out as an area. There was a general consensus from all interviewees that ticketing on the side was complicated and could be simplified. One operator felt that the bus quality network um, they're the biggest plus for customers because they give the interoperability of tickets and it's made a positive difference to the customer. Similarly, they thought my ticket was successful because it's made things easier for young people. Um, another element to come out was about partnership working, again, looking at the journey from start to finish. Um, it was noted that the customer experience could be improved significantly if partnership working was strengthened with the local authorities. At Mersey Travel, the operator and the local authorities all influence the customer's journey experience, and there's a need for them to work together to deliver a and then finally on this page, the customer journey from A to B, it's the added extras on the journey. Wi-Fi was an added extra that bus customers used and appreciated. Better seeking and driver professionalism were added extras that had an impact on how the customer rated their experience also, along with the quality of the vehicles. Um, one of the train operators mentioned that low stop quality is a driver for customer satisfaction. So just to look at the resource implications, um, there may be impact on resource implications if the recommendations are approved. However, no direct impact or no direct implications are associated with the production of the report. So finally, just to complete this report, um, the customer satisfaction rating is an insightful piece of intelligence to help further understand the customer base. Customer comments, including complaints and help were a very important source of customer intelligence and how these were handled ultimately influenced the overall customer satisfaction rate of an organization. Um, passenger focus surveys noted that um, drivers of quality um, such as <laughs> um, 
sorry, looking to drive patronage and growth, we need to be understanding the economy and how public transport feeds into things like access to jobs and the likes. Mystery Shop Group of Work um, provides more kind of depth of detail around customer journey experience and the intelligence gathered feeds into the service delivery plans within Mersey Travel. A key to improving customer satisfaction is to understand the key influencers of the whole journey experience from A to B and how these impact on customer experience and ultimately satisfaction. The main areas identified within the review are information, so ensuring that the information provided to customers is accurate and timely. For ticketing, um, it should not only focus on Mersey Travel's tickets, but also consider the ticket ticketing offer from the operators to give a holistic view on what is available to the customers. Partnership working with um, operators and the local authority is key to improving um, the seamless end-to-end -end journey experience for the customer. And finally, the little added extras, um, quality and appearance of the bus or the train did influence the customer's judgment of the journey. Added extras such as Wi-Fi um, enhance the overall experience for the customer. Any questions? Thanks very much for that, Katrina. Do you have any, uh, any questions? Yeah, just one thing, I mean, it's, uh, it's a good in-depth, excellent report, and I thank you for that, and uh, the officers who are with you. Uh, also, again, it's what we're here for, we're looking at our customers, our passengers, to see how we can best serve them throughout our bus, ferries, rail, and every form of transport, and, you know, let's be fair about it, the customers are the most important people in this game because it's uh, it's all about bums on seats and that generates the income to keep people going. So, uh, can I thank you again? And also, can I thank the uh, operators who took part in the survey because, again, another excellent survey. So, with the two surveys, uh, I think we've made a good start to this uh, uh, <laughs> subcommittee. So, and also, can I thank the members who took part as well on this? Katrina, thank you. Can we move the uh, recommendations on paragraph two of the report? Do you agree with that? Thank you. Now, item six is the rail passengers, uh, passengers and ticketing. Uh, Wayne, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, this report um, came out as a recommendation from the General Purposes Subcommittee in Town of February. Um, yeah, specifically, uh, the report identified uh, inspected rail services for the year um, April to September 2014 that there was an apparent decline in passengers on the city line and a continually increasing mobile passenger numbers over the same period compared to the previous year. Um, what this report does is it provides some further analysis of the passenger data that was presented uh, at a lower level down, but I will uh, emphasise that, that the work is incomplete. And so what this report is also doing is looking to identify where further work needs to be done. What we do have today is we have um, Paul Bowen and Elaine Farrington from Mesa Rail, and we have Craig Carrick from um, Northern Rail with us to uh, help members um, better explain uh, the differences in the data and um, where we presently are. In terms of uh, looking at the data, we had kind of three aims really, one of which is um, to understand the ticketing um, better, um, to look at the Northern Rail patronage and um, to test um, why it seems to be in decline, and also to look at the Mesa Rail patronage and to start to get some understanding as, uh, as to why we've been so successful. Um, the analysis then goes on to identify that of the uh, reported reduction uh, of around about 3.2% on the city line, um, there are a number of um, key areas of ticketing time that appears to have been uh, reduced. And similarly, for the increase um, of around about 4% on the rural and northern lines, um, where they where they improve. Um, we can go into the detail of where the analysis takes us to, but I think what it actually does is, as the members will see, is um, this analysis does actually provoke a number of other questions that we haven't answered the report as yet. Um, so what we're suggesting that we need to do is we do need to do a bit more work in respect to understand those causal factors. Um, do, I think, want to look at a full year's performance because at the moment um, we're only looking at um, the first half of those two comparative years. Um, and similarly, what we want to do is because um, there are two different um, types of data that we can use for comparison purposes, is to look at doing some correlation between the actual detailed passenger information and ticket information from the operators, which I'm sure um, those present can comment upon. Um, 
but this is a piece of work that we need to do as part of um, the developments and announcements that took place on Friday in respect of transport for the north. And one of the first pieces of work that was agreed with the DSE that we will do is to do a much more comprehensive demand study in respect of the proposals for connectivity um, to the hub. So we'll sweep up some of the analysis in respect of that. Um, have you taken any questions of our colleagues here? Um, so I'm going to the uh, thanks very much for that, Wayne. Uh, Paul, do you want to come in on uh, Mersey Rail? Any comments for the update? Thank you, Chair. Um, thanks for the opportunity to uh, clarify the, the data. Um, I, I guess the first comment is that, as, as Wayne indicated, we, we do recognise the fact that there are disparities in some of the data between two organisations. But typically, we show the same sort of trends so we can uh, uh, support the, the, the premise of the uh, approximately 4% growth in that period. Um, I think in terms of explaining that growth, we should know that there were two significant events during that period of time, uh, one being the Giants and the other being the, the Open Gulf. Um, those generated about 2% of the growth year on year, so that should be noted there. Um, alongside that though, we do have 2% in underlying growth, which uh, is, is really a result of the fact that we, we continue to provide a, a very good, reliable service. We've just uh, spoken about the, the customer experience and how important that is in maintaining the customer base. Um, we've also put quite a lot of effort in on the marketing side over that period of time uh, and continue to do so. Um, we have a, a quite ambitious five-year growth plan in place now as well, which we we'll, should see improved growth in, in future years. Um, and also within that is the natural economic growth in the city, uh, which continues to be quite positive. Um, so all in all, I mean, we, we do feel there's quite a good story to tell on, on the Mesa Travel Network at the moment. And so the Mesa Rail Network So that's, um, I'll take any questions if there's any further. Okay, thanks for that, Bob. Craig, do you have anything to bring from Northern, please? Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Um, I think, uh, going back to Wayne's original point and the recommendations in the paper, I think um, to do further work on, on this report once the 12 months uh, data is captured, I think is, is a worthwhile thing to do. Um, once we uh, were made aware of the data, we did a 100% um, data, actual data review, comparing 13-14 year with 14-15. Um, if we look at the city lines in isolation, um, over the almost completed year, rather than the six months, it actually shows um, growth of 2.3%. Uh, when compared to the previous year. So there has been marginal growth there. Um, however, looking at the actual Mersey uh, products, they're actually down around 2%. So uh, I think it's key um, that we compare um, both reports um, at the end of the year. Uh, I think the data will be available in April, May time. Um, what we can do then is compare it with the industry systems. So there are two systems that we can use. Um, one is Lennon, which um, details every single ticket that's been issued on the, on the city lines rather than an estimate. And um, there is the other system which is called that, uh, APC, which basically counts the amount of people that are on our trains. Um, so as Wayne said, um, once we have all the data, we can do a proper correlation. Um, looking at the start of the year, um, it's clear that it's been quite, it was quite sluggish 14, 15. Um, that could be for a variety of reasons. I think um, some of the main drivers have been um, the engineering work that we've had on the city lines, blockades at Hyderabad and Roby, as well as the electrification work, and, and indeed the um, closures of um, these, the line up to St. Helens on certain Sundays um, will have an impact. Um, looking ahead, um, it's, it's looking really positive. We've got our new electric trains just uh, entered service now and they'll continue to roll out throughout the year. Those give us much more capacity, uh, better quality of service, uh, and it's the first time that we'll be able to market the, uh, the peak services um, uh, for as long as I can remember anyway. So um, there's a, a huge opportunity there to tap into uh, the suppressed demand. Um, and uh, in terms of the revenue collection on board our trains, the, the, the new 309s, it allows the conductor to be in the saloon rather than in the back cab because they can operate the doors um, from, from local door controls. Uh, in addition to that, we are trialling mobile ticketing and uh, we're developing a brand new website which makes ticket purchasing a lot easier for, for our customers. 
uh, effectively they can get the tickets uh, or the season tickets or any products in the future from the comfort of their own home on a, on a Sunday afternoon perhaps while watching the football. Um, so I think in summary, um, our figures show a growth of 2.3% uh, and we're keen to compare the results in May. Thanks for that, Craig. At least uh, kind of got positive notes with the electric trains, and uh, you sound a little bit despondent, but you sort of worked up to a, uh, a final crescendo there. <laughs> oh, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. <laughs> Any questions for any of John? Thanks, Jeff. Very brief one from me. I really wanted to link it to the previous item about buses, really. I think we shouldn't underestimate the importance of Wi Fi here and how important it is to actually have it on both our buses and trains, it would encourage young people to come on and use their mobiles, older people to actually work, enable them to work. If you go on long distance trains, for example, they're nearly always they are available for us on shorter distance journeys, they're not. And I think some sort of movement towards that would be extremely helpful in terms of growing uh, this area of our transport. Okay, so I don't know if colleagues want to comment on that, but I'm interested to hear what you say. Thank you. Yes, uh, Sure, I can go on that. Um, firstly, the thing to mention on that is the five year growth plan that was mentioned, I thought a little bit earlier, one of the initiatives is one by uh, on the underground stations as a pilot scheme. So that, that's already committed to uh, and see how that rolls out. That's certainly enough. Yeah. Thanks a lot, Craig. Uh, Craig, just very quickly, Chair, we, we are currently trialling free Wi Fi on our electric trains in, in the Yorkshire area for a uh, view to rolling out. The new franchise specification for, for Northern and Trans Pennine Express will indicate, or sorry, has, has, uh, has stated that all services will have free Wi Fi on during the, uh, the first part of that franchise. Um, we're also trialling free Wi Fi on stations currently. Thank you, Dr. Craig. Sorry, Thanks, Chair. This is for me. It's a great welcome. Yeah, loads and loads and loads more people on the train. It's fantastic. At what point do you reach capacity? Um, what have you got to mitigate that capacity? Because at some point, if you keep on growing and growing and growing, at some point it's going to kill. Right, we can train up the past again. Um, we, we monitor uh, capacity uh, and um, quite closely. We know that we have many rooms at the moment where we, we do reach capacity during the week, particularly the, uh, uh, the line from Southport. We, we've experienced quite a lot of problems there in the morning. Um, capacity is a, is a big feature in the work that we're doing with the rolling stock uh, group in terms of ensuring that any future rolling stock strategy picks up on those capacity constraints. We, we do know it's a challenge um, for the uh, plan to put within the travel of the South to uh, look at the capacity of the road. Thanks for that, Paul. And as you say about the rolling stock, I mean, there's nobody more aware than the members of the staff here. Uh, the need for new rolling stock because, you know, as you uh, say, and we all know, Mersey Rail operates, you know, the best service in the country, and you need to be uh, offering even better service with new rolling stock. So, you know, we're all behind you there. It's just a matter of trying to push the button to, to get the new rolling stock. See you, mate. Yeah, just uh, an observation of some, some of the, the language. That was used. I've heard it in a previous presentation from, from Northern uh, Rail. Uh, the, uh, you, you said that you would clarify the figures by actually counting passengers compared to ticket sales. Which is that being it, it's a, it, there's a non payment issue going on or a non collection of tickets on board? Because some of your stations are I'm not as familiar with that line as I am with Mersey Rail. You see, so so is that being that, that, that you're not you're not collecting with fares? Um, I think that in, in the context of what, what I was responding to, it was, it was more about comparing the um, estimated figures that, that have been generated from the Nurse Shaft report and comparing it with our actual figures. Um, in, in, uh, the, the reason I mentioned APC, that's a system that can help with demand forecasting and when you're developing business cases, um, such as was also referred to in the report. My other comments are, are, are Mersey Rail from the perspective of the world. I think the, the advancements and the interconnectivity with the park and ride scheme is probably another underlying trend that makes it more accessible and a more attractive option. I came on the bus this morning, it was a toss up in my own mind whether 
month or so went by uh, from Birkenhead North. So, so you know, it would have always been the bus, but now, now, now I can, I know I've got somewhere to park safe. There's, there's that option as well. So I think that is, is helping the connectivity issues with me as well. But uh, I think it's, it's got to be, it's encouraging, is it not, that um, both, both are predicting increase in, in passengers. Yeah. Uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm happy. And thanks for the uh, clarification. Thanks for that, Steve. Thanks for that, Craig. So, I mean, once you get to know the amount of passengers you've got, uh, Craig, you can then sort of look to the future and tailor, tailor your network to the amount of passengers present and project the amount of passengers. Because the best of the service usually uh, that attracts the passenger. And of course, you've got to have any, you've got presently before you. Uh, and also, it would impact on your ticket sales as well, won't it? Hopefully. Uh, any further questions? Okay, can we uh, agree the recommendations on paragraph two of the report? Thank you. Can I thank you for your participation? Very clear, mate. Um, uh, Paul, thank you. Can we go on to now item seven, the ticketing <coughs> to understand <coughs> the better market? Stephen, please. Thank you, chat. <coughs> uh, this report is really just to summarise. Um, in answer to the participating in the full system of the meeting at the moment, to supervise an analysis of the uh, sitting in the planning market in operation across the exercise, but then in wider context as well. And so the main driver for the report was just to take uh, an implicit overview of, of the marketplace and really understand its, its complexity and diversity and the range of products that are available. Uh, the market across the, the area is incredibly diverse. There are a range of products available at the within. Uh, portfolio, but also on a spare basis via uh, the operators themselves. Uh, the the prepaid ticketing scheme is a much operated on to partnership, including bus, rail, ferry, passenger services, and is administered by Mercy Travel. Uh, our product portfolio includes Solo, Trio, Rail Pass, Save, Work, Rose, and all those are reimbursed to the operators. So, one of the key intentions for the scheme at the moment is that it needs to provide sort of stable and best value process across the industry of network and in the future also needs to recognise the impact of bottom and others as well. In looking at what's important to customers as well, uh, some of the existing segmentation and market analysis research that we've brought together in the preparing report really sort of uh, demonstrate some of the emerging key common themes that we find in that we've got choice, convenience, amenity, money being core factors that uh, for customer choice. And looking at the market share as well, uh, we've looked at the segmentation across the major side of the market share and we see that some of the key statistics that emerge are that 38% of the rail market in side is operated under uh, a most of the prepaid scheme. 48% of the bus market in most of the is operated under a most of the prepaid scheme. And some of the other emerging statistics include the fact that 96% uh, most of destinations are within Merseyside, with 87% uh, of journey points within the district. However, that's not uh, a fully comprehensive 360 review. And one of the calls of the report is the fact that we need to place this information in the ground some of the wider information about what potentially form partners in the operating companies as well. So, the journey purposes and reasons for travel uh, a very high percentage of travel is work based or education based. Uh, it peaks in the mornings at around 8 a.m. In the evenings between 3.30 and 5 o'clock, or uh, whilst we shopping at the bedside as well. So, looking at the journeys by ticket group, uh, you've seen from 2001 there's been a decline in cash fare to mostly the rest of us, and combining cash and operators prepaid tickets, the insertion of the operators prepaid tickets, tickets uh, evidently and the best cash fare as time has passed. It's, it's migration over time, it's a general trend we've seen. So looking at the ticket groups, um, whilst uh, looking into the data from 2001 up to 2013-14 is available, uh, we can see that the, the general sort of tra trade for um, multi-operator journey travel is it's been displaced by operator prepaid tickets, but there has been an element of uh, general recovery experience since 2011 and 2012, because the lifting very slightly uh, towards the end of the last year. Uh, we've also looked in the report at uh, Pricing and uh, the statistics that emerged there are the fact that the cost of the bus has risen significantly, 
uh, faster than locomotive transport. So in general, that's about 156% since 2000, compared to 65% for the rest of the motor rail, and 22% for uh, the answers for the rest of the motor costs on a comparable basis. So in comparison, uh, motor science fares in comparison with London, uh, it's the retail price index, uh, increase the rate of the market like on the London average as well. So product pricing, uh, an interesting point to reiterate here is the fact that one of the reports commissioned uh, by April 2010 from Motor Travel identified that a 10% increase in bus fares would consequently result in a 3.4% drop in the demand for bus services. Uh, and in conclusion, one of the findings was that Mersey side tickets seem to be higher price numbers, including London. So there are other issues as well in comparing uh, the fares in the sense that because we have such diverse product portfolio across the Mersey side, I mean, so in terms of but obviously operator tickets, it's very difficult to make a direct fare comparison. Uh, Multi-mobile products are more expensive than multi-operator or single operator tickets. Uh, there are geographical variants scheme. Child prices are not always available for published material. That was seen as a premium for interoperability of products as well. Uh, operators do not always retail the same, dura uh, same duration variant for similar products. There's not a consistent product offering across the scheme owners, and uh, not all of the data published are on printed digital platforms readily available. There are thousands of variants that are potentially be made only products across the journey. So from the customer perspective, and I think it's, it's very important for us the customer of this, um, because we've got the ability to have an informed choice when choosing the right product that meets the needs of the best value. It's become more difficult to navigate the best price of products if operator own products are introduced alongside the most travel to the scheme. Uh, this often results in products and pricing strategies that are not always complementary and this can lead to a potential uh, customer confusion in the market. Also, passengers find it difficult and problematic to assess uh, products particular benefits in comparison to others based on these different terms. Just another few points on the customer perspective as well. The Zomal products seek to simplify the particular offering, but there's still, uh, again, thousands of variants on point to point prices that can be made. Uh, the extensive searching by customers is needed in buying the best value of tickets, so you have to work on the combinations of the search and retrieve that information on a, on a needs based basis. Uh, and customers would benefit from operators making products offer less complex and pricing more accessible just to reiterate some of the earlier points that were made there. There's also the element of uh, technology and advancement in the way the products have been tailored. Uh, for example, we know that many of the operators now uh, are operating on digital platforms much more effectively, e-commerce, mobile ticketing, e-ticketing and redemption are really coming to the fore now. That's taking these products very much direct to market. Ticketing is my greatest digital in my customer expectation. So, some of the observations we've drawn down and uh, come through from the reports include that it's very important that we anticipate how changing means of customers uh, are to tailor the really shape of the products and services that we provide. And the current data sources do not always provide us with the full picture of the city region. And this is sometimes where most travel and our colleagues would benefit from working. Closely on a collective basis with our stakeholders uh, to develop where possible a combined analysis model uh, for the market component quality. So, the ability to understand the customer and the market better uh, will be limited unless we consider the digital technologies that will capture uh, smart data, market transactional data on a group basis, and the introduction of smart server, for example, is the first step on that journey of the way that we have done data. In terms of recommendations uh, in supporting the corporate plan priorities, uh, we recommend that more work is undertaken to understand the total public transport market, uh, which must include Halton as well as decision and the authority. Uh, this will culminate with a greater understanding about the market, the customer, and help improve the customer experience. Growing that will actually achieve our products offering the market. Thanks very much for that, Stephen. Again, another. I think superb in depth report. It does go in depth into talks about a lot of London. Of course, one of the main things it's thrown up is one of the most deprived areas of the country and we're being charged one of the highest fare ratios, you know, which how people can 
justify that is, uh, is beyond me. So it's a wonderful tool for us to be able to say, if you can do it cheaper there, what's wrong with us? You know, it's, it's, uh, where's the equality? I mean, deregulation was supposed to create competition. All that stuff seems to be shifted the price to the, one of the farthest regions in the country. Do we have any questions here? Yeah. 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 Go on, Marlene, please. Thoughts like this, you see, will give us uh, the ammunition <coughs> to take to operators and say, justify this. And if you can't justify it, how can you impose it? John. Sure. Thanks, Chair. Thanks so much. Just, just briefly on the impact of new technologies. We seem to be on different time frames for different bus operators in terms of their ability to bring the digital revolution on the stream. We're just wondering, again, in terms of growing passion how important this agenda is um, and, and what, what colleagues over there have got to say in terms of actually addressing this agenda and moving it forward quite swiftly because it is very important. If you can go into a, into a shop now and use contactless to pay less than £20, the majority, I suspect, I'm not an expert, the majority of journeys will be a lot less than £20. It must be fairly simple and straightforward to utilise that same technology on your buses. I'm just wondering what's the time frame you've got and uh, I'm, I'm sure it will help grow your uh, business. Have you got anything you might have asked me? Is that fair? Thank you. Uh, yes, I mean, I think in, in terms of the advent of smart cities and the competition around certain digital technology is something we're addressing, and absolutely uh, front and centre, I think, is a consideration when we're operating in the wider world of uh, digital benefit. And it does now speak to a much larger share of the market than, than before, and it is growing as well. So it's something we're looking at in the context of smart cities and development. It's something we're looking at in the context of our of our mobile presence in the apps and the development there. E-commerce, for example, we're, we're about to go uh, live with a new version of the online shop for the Mercy Ferries uh, to get off that. But it is something that we do need to have in place to make this uh, possible for all of our uh, peers out there, not only in the transport city, but why in retail? Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, Steve. I mean, even I've just got a new debit card, and I mean, you just don't even have to swipe it to the home for 20 pounds, uh, transit options, you know, so, these things, and once we get our ticket strategy together, and we have the one ticket, I mean, that is what the, what the aim is for. This one. Thanks, Chair. Obviously, members will be aware of course of our work on smart city yeah. thing. Um, we are currently refining what the customer proposition is, and as part of that, we are working very closely with the four main operators, two main bus, two main rail, and the main lobby some subsets of that. In relation to contactless, and I agree with the, with the Chair, I've recently got my um, new visa debit and I enjoy using contactless, but we... You two get the round in there. <laughs> 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 bit cheaper, I'm less than 20 quid. <laughs> uh, but as part of that, obviously, we have to look to the future, and obviously, uh, Transport in the North talks about um, smart city across the whole of the North region, and mentions contactless 
in relation to that. But in terms of our offer, we have to be really clear what is our tickets offer, and it's the point that Stephen um, talked about in, in terms of the, when you presented the report, is what's the tickets offer, what's the measure of the tickets offer, so what's the customer tickets offer from the operators, and making sure that it's a clear, clean offer for the customer so that they can actually work out what's the best value for them for the journey that they're making. And that's part of the discussion that we've taken forward to the, the smart tickets strategy. Thanks for the link. Um, I just want to echo the points that you and Marlene made up because genuinely Steve came to step out on something this is an exceptional piece of work and I typically kind of appreciate how challenging it has been to, to pull together. So Catriona talked about the lack of a simple fair structure, I'd call it more a jungle probably, because of the amount of different things that are out there that you have to, to get your head around. So really well done in what you pulled together. And the fact that you've done it in such a succinct manner and highlighted not just gremlins, some sort of harsh realities um, in the system. Uh, for me, some of the most significant ones are independencies. The fact that you know, the overall market is shrinking, the number of people making public transport journeys over the last 15 years is going down, is not a good place for us to be. When you go into it more depth, naturally, the rail side of things is great. It's grown by a third over the last 15 uh, years. It's the bus side of things that's really let this down. And let's be honest about that, we've been brutally blunt about it. It's because of a value money proposition. Yeah. Yeah, the rail fares in this part of the world, overall, are pretty good value. It's the bus fares that ain't. Yeah. And actually, Appendix 2 is the point that highlights it the most. Um, most of the trips are within people's districts. Um, that highlights me more than anything else the need for a short hop fare. Because at this moment in time, £2.20 is £2.30 or 50 in other parts of the economy go half a mile, it's too expensive. And that is one of the key reasons that people aren't making those journeys, frankly. So the way that you've been able to highlight those points, and that's before you even go on to the fact that we're charged more than other parts of the country, by the same companies, at least in Twilight um, School. It's a fantastic sort of report in terms of insight. I think the most important thing, though, is about the fact that it's great, this is the first time we've actually genuinely done this for the whole transport yeah. network of Merseyside. And that yes, we do need to do more work because it's that insight that's absolutely clear. So if we genuinely want to change things, which yes is about leveraging the current environment, but more importantly and more hopefully, could be a change of approach that a change of government and a change of legislation could bring. Actually it opens a whole raft of opportunities to do things more simplistically, which is what yeah, is vital to customer satisfaction. But actually more importantly, better value which isn't just the right thing to do get, to get more bums on seats. Actually, it's the right thing to do by businesses as well. Yeah, if, you, if I was a bus company looking at this, I'd be really worried about the fact that the numbers are going down because actually how much money is in the fare box. So a different approach with better insights actually isn't just the right thing to do for our community. It's also the right thing to do for the businesses involved as well. So thanks ever so much for this work. And I think we all look forward to future incarnations and the greater depth and detail that we can get into. Thank you. Thanks, Liam. Sorry. <coughs> yeah, in relation to Paul Marlene said regarding taxi, taxi use taking on more work because buses are not. In, in London, obviously, they, they use the cars to live as the taxis and, and, the, uh, and the bus services. I think the competition is already there from the taxis. But that's set by the local authorities. The rates are set by the local authorities. And it's, I think it's been about six years now since each authority has given an increase to the taxis and they've chosen not to take an increase because it would diminish their passenger numbers. So that they've accepted that this front they're given what passengers can afford. And when you're looking at apprentices, young apprentices going to work at two pound eighty an hour. You're asking them to spend 20% of their salary on full space or just get to and from work. Well, I'm not sure I couldn't imagine spending 20% of my wages going to and from work. It, it's just an astronomical amount for the young person to ask me to. And if, when this car is established and out there in the, in the community, that we can actually put products together that deliver them so that it's affordable. Particularly those young people. Who are the, 
do an apprenticeship because they can be delivering the future for these companies. Um, if, if they're not able to get to and from a, a reasonable cost, they'll just move away from the area completely. Um, Thanks, Sally. And well, I think uh, reports like this highlight that problem. And of course, what's this in black and white? And it's been researched, you know, Stephen Case put a wonderful job on this. It's ideal to be able to go to operators and say, these are the facts, justify those, because what you're doing, you're driving customers away. And of course, the minute we start to get headlines in newspapers to say, you know, it's the bus companies themselves who are destroying their business, uh, it, you know, it uh, helps our hand, no, uh, no, no end. So, there's no more questions. Uh, can uh, we agree the recommendations on paragraph two of the report? Thank you very much. I think one thing about this uh, this subcommittee, it's been, to my mind, a very interesting afternoon. You know, we have touched on some very good topical and interesting subjects and a rather good looking depth of them. So I'm going to thank everybody for participation, for their inputs and attendance. Can I close the meeting? Thank you.